All right, so why don't we get started? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today we have two of our chief residents, uh, Tim Kahn and Patrick Kellum, giving um, 25 minute lectures each on a couple of what I consider to be pretty interesting topics. Um, both of these, I think, have application for all of us across subspecialty. And um, looking forward to it. Tim, looks like you're starting whenever you're ready. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Fisher. All right, good morning. Um, my name is Tim Kahn. I'm one of the PGY5s. I realized that the email title was anesthesia in the geriatric patient, but I decided to narrow the topic a bit um, to a question that seems to have come up quite a bit lately. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the cognitive effects of surgery in the geriatric patient. Before we get started, though, I wanted to share some of my personal research. As you may know, I consider myself a scientist of sorts, most famous for the previous Becoming Dunsing study that you may have seen presented at graduation last year. Well, given the current subject matter, I thought that if the stress of surgery was enough to cause cognitive decline, then five years of orthopedic residency must do something to the brain. Therefore, I decided the easiest way to look at this would be to just do a quick observational study of the academic pursuits of my class, which is certainly to be remembered as one of the most academically gifted residency classes to enter this program. And one easy way to do this would, would be to just look at the caliber of our current PGY-5 grand round presentations. For instance, Graham presented on whether one or two plates is stronger. Josh presented on the history of one of the two surgical approaches he will do for the rest of his life. <laughs> Patrick is still confused on what the p-value means. And me, as Graham delicately put it, I'm presenting on the realization that old people get confused sometimes. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say that cognitive decline in orthopedic residency is real. That being said, Todd hasn't presented yet, so he still has a chance to present on something on some real science like lactic acid. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to start off today by giving you a typical case presentation that you might see on any given orthopedic call weekend. So patient JS is an 84 year old male who presented to us with left hip pain after a ground level fall. He has several well-controlled medical conditions um, and he normally ambulates without assistance. He denies tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. Here's a picture of an AP radiograph of his pelvis. By now, if you've been doing this job for any number of years, you've likely already synthesized this patient history and radiographs into what you believe would be the most effective treatment plan. However, while we as orthopedists pride ourselves in pragmatic efficiency, it's worth taking a step back to remember who our patients are and what they're concerned about. For instance, what if I told you patient JS is a former successful businessman who now lives in Salt Lake City near his middle-aged children. He recently retired, but he still frequently consults for his previous company. He enjoys road biking, reading books, and is still very involved in his church. However, he has been slowing lately and is showing more signs of his age, as his children put it. He has had increasing falls with more benign activities, with this last fall being a misstep coming off the porch. The patient and his family are in the room. We'll pretend this is pre-COVID, and they want to know his prognosis. What does this mean in the long term? If you're an astute and conscientious physician, you tell them that the statistics are somewhat sobering. Despite our best efforts, there's about a 20 to 30% mortality rate at one year in patients with a hip fracture. The recovery will be difficult, but expedient surgical intervention gives them the best chance for survival, and you have data to back that up. While this dialogue is important, is mortality really even what's most important to our patients, though? A paper out of the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 looked at how elderly patients with severe illness value their functional and cognitive outcome in weighing treatment decisions. They asked over 200 patients over 60 years old with limited life expectancy due to their illness whether they would choose a life-saving treatment if the outcome of that treatment was severe functional and or cognitive impairment. Perhaps not too surprising to us was that nearly 88% of those stated that they would rather die than live with severe cognitive impairment. From a personal perspective, we likely have all felt the devastation of seeing loved ones slowly lose their grip on reality to dementia or illness and can attest that the ability to think and communicate are fundamental to what it means to be human. To quote Aristotle, I think, therefore I am. So that leaves us with this question. What do we tell the patient and his family about what to expect in terms of his cognitive function? What are the chances he gets delirium? Perhaps they have a friend who is never quite the same after, the sh after their surgery. Will that happen to him? Is there anything we as physicians can do to help prevent cognitive impairment? Today, I hope to help us understand some of these issues regarding the cognitive effects of orthopedic surgery in our geriatric patients. As an outline, we'll work to define the issues at hand and understand the continuum between delirium and postoperative cognitive decline. We'll then turn our attention to understanding how common postoperative cognitive decline is and what to expect in our patients. We'll spend some time thinking about the etiology of these cognitive changes and what we think is contributing. Finally, we'll discuss what we are currently doing to help prevent cognitive impairment and potential future interventions for the condition. 
As we think about cognitive changes following surgery, there are two very broad categories of cognitive decline we see in geriatric patients postoperatively. One being delirium, which we are likely more familiar with and is an acute change in cognition. The second, which is more ill-defined and less discussed is postoperative cognitive decline or POCD, which refers to longer term changes in cognitive abilities following surgery. While these must be understood as separate entities, there's likely a sort of continuum between these two. And at this point, the treatment and prevention of them seem to be interrelated. As the concept of postoperative cognitive decline is likely less familiar to you, I'd like to start by, by understanding and defining this diagnosis prior to discussing delirium. POCD is a not uncommon decline in cognitive performance, concentration, and the ability to process information that is observed mostly in geriatric patients postoperatively. As you will see, the diagnosis of POCD has been somewhat ill-defined, and we've only recently made strides in standardizing the diagnosis with neurocognitive testing. For all of us as orthopedic surgeons, though, this is really the elephant in the room that just hasn't been acknowledged, since we all know that many of our patients suffer long-term cognitive, cognitive decline after surgery. Dr. Bedford, a physician in the UK, was perhaps the first to describe what is now known as postoperative cognitive decline in 1955, when he described his observations of the adverse effects of anesthesia in his geriatric patients. Dr. Bedford presumed, as would many others for several decades, that this decline was due to poor cerebral perfusion um, um, during surgery, with an assumption that the geriatric brain was more susceptible due to pre-existing vascular insufficiency. In his paper, Dr. Bedford describes a series of interesting cases, which are much more colorful than anything that would be allowed in a scientific journal today. Skipping the more culturally obtuse case examples, I'll read you a relevant excerpt. So case four, a woman aged 73 first came under our care for sciatica, from which she made a full recovery. She was an intelligent, active person who took a keen interest in everyday affairs. She looked after her husband and did all her housework and shopping without assistance. She was knocked down by a motor car, sustaining as her only injury a fracture of the neck of the right femur. There was no loss of consciousness, and on admission to hospital, she remembered her accident and gave a detailed account of herself. Her fracture was pinned under general anesthesia. On recovery, she was confused, disoriented, and doubly incontinent. She was given morphine and subsequently barbiturates, but her dementia failed to improve on withdrawal of the drugs. Her blood urea, electrocardiogram, and blood pressure were normal. There were no postoperative chest complications and no abnormal neurological signs. Her fracture united soundly, but she remained grossly demented. She was doubly incontinent and mentally inaccessible. She could feed herself with assistance, but was never able to walk unaided. Though she would respond to simple commands and seem to know her name, she was unaware of her surroundings and did not recognize her relations who were shocked at the change in her. Over the next 12 months, she made some slight improvement and was looked after at home by her family, but she remained doubly incontinent and would sit in a chair most of the day, doing nothing and taking no interest or part in the life going on about her. She remained grossly demented until her death 15 months after her accident following a coronary thrombosis. So while our care for these patients has certainly advanced since the 1950s, we are all very familiar with such a story amongst our own patients. However, the diagnosis of POCD has been somewhat elusive over the years due to the lack of consensus on the best method. Although less objective, the diagnosis is really dependent on a perceived loss of cognitive function. However, it is agreed that the diagnosis of POCD must be supported by objective deficits or a significant decline in neurocognitive testing. Delirium is a more familiar diagnosis to most of us. It's defined by five hallmark characteristics, which is a disturbance in attention and awareness, an impaired cognition, an acute presentation that fluctuates throughout the day, an absence of a pre-existing neurocognitive disorder, and it must be related to an ongoing medical or surgical condition. In the clinical setting, most hospitals, including our own, have checklists or algorithms that help in the diagnosis of delirium, like the very efficient and accurate CAM ICU test. In general, delirium has a flavor much closer to psychosis um, with an acute loss of grip on reality. As I stated earlier, there's a growing body of evidence that link delirium and POCD, and perhaps both are understood better in terms of chronology following surgery. This has led to further nomenclature changes to split POCD into categories related to, to timing after surgery. For simplicity's, sake, I'll stick, for simplicity's sake, I'll stick to the older definition of POCD for this presentation. As is probably not too much of a surprise, delirium is extremely common. Including all causes of delirium, it affects more than 2.6 million adults each year in the US and results in over $164 billion in expenditure. It is especially common following cardiac surgery, but is nearly just as common in the geriatric hip fracture population, where postoperative delirium has an incidence up to 50%. And although we inherently know that delirium has many short-term effects, it also has many long-term repercussions. Several studies have established an increased mortality in patients who experience delirium. In a study out of the VA in Denver, they found that among patients over 50 who underwent major surgery, those who experienced delirium had a 59% mortality at five years, compared to 13% mortality in those without delirium. 
even with multivariate regression, the odds ratio of mortality was over seven. As you will see, it is well established that delirium is associated with longer term postoperative cognitive dysfunction. Furthermore, the, um, the severity of delirium, specifically how long it persists during the hospitalization, is related to long-term outcomes as well. In this paper from 2012, 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, 225 patients, 60 and older, who were undergoing cardiac surgery were prospectively enrolled. They underwent preoperative and postoperative neurocognitive testing, which included tests at one week, three months, six months, and one year. And those patients who developed delirium postoperatively, which was nearly 46%, there was a significantly greater rate of cognitive decline at six months and one year. These findings were further substantiated by a study out of Germany where 200 hip surgery patients older than 60 were followed for a minimum of three years postoperatively. 41 of the patients developed delirium postoperatively and at three years, 54% of the patients who suffered delirium continued to have cognitive deficits compared to only 4.4% of the non-delirious patients. Interestingly, the difference in cognitive function, which was, um, was most pronounced at three years rather than at one year, suggesting that delirium may be a harbinger of eventual dementia. Another interesting study by Dr. Sprung evaluated elderly patients enrolled in a prospective study at Mayo that follows, um, a um, follows cognitive function across a large local cohort. In the cohort, 2,000 patients underwent surgery during the study period, and about 4% of those patients developed postoperative delirium. The frequency of a new diagnosis of dementia in the several years following sur surgery was 33% in those who had had delirium, compared to just 9% in those who did not. <clears throat> how about POCD? Exactly how common is it? Well, it was first described in major cardiac surgery, as neurocognitive dysfunction was noted to be extremely high in these patients postoperatively, again, bolstering the thought that this was due to a form of vascular insult to the brain. In a well-designed study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2001, Dr. Newman found that among 261 patients who underwent cabbage, 53% of those were found to have cognitive decline at discharge, 36% at six weeks, and 24% at six months. However, the rate actually worsened at five years with 42% of the patients having cognitive decline, suggesting as other studies have, that there is an initial improvement over the first year and then a gradual decline. The reported rates of POCD and non-cardiac surgery have been highly variable as most studies are somewhat heterogeneous. However, in the largest studies compiling all major non-cardiac surgery, the rate has been about 10% at three months for patients older than 60. In a landmark study on the issue published in The Lancet in 1998, Dr. Moeller performed a large perspective multi-center study of 1,200 patients at least 60 years old who underwent major non-cardiac surgery. Patients underwent neuropsychological testing prior to surgery at one week and at three months after surgery. Oxygen saturation, and blood pressure were closely monitored during surgery and for the first three days postoperatively. A control group was matched from unhospitalized UK residents. The results were that 25% of the patients had some amount of cognitive dysfunction at one week and 10% had cognitive dysfunction at three months. Age was the only significant risk factor for cognitive dysfunction at three months. And importantly, hypoxia and hypotension were not associated with POCD. In a prospective study out of Duke of nearly 400 patients older than 55 undergoing major non-cardiac surgery, patients underwent extensive pre and post-operative neurocognitive testing up to one year. They found in their group that POCD was present in 54% of their patients at six weeks and 46% at one year. So why does post-operative decline happen? Well, remember that first study I showed you by Dr. Bradford in 1955? He, as well as many others to come, presumed that this, that this was due to cerebral vascular issues and was really a form of vascular dementia that was probably exacerbated by intraoperative hypotension. However, this theory really broke down um, with that large study um, by Dr. Muller published in 1998, where they had only looked at non-cardiac patients and measured blood pressure and oxygenation throughout surgery, um, as well as perioperatively, and found no correlation to POCD. So arose theories that this was due to anesthetics, but that hasn't really borne out for several reasons. There has been no consistent evidence to show that different anesthetic agents affect POCD, and there has been no different rates of cognitive decline between neuraxial and general anesthetics. Finally, a multitude of animal studies have demonstrated that it is most likely the stress of surgery itself that leads to the cognitive changes. To understand this, probably the first thing to know is that there are some important changes that take place as the normal human brain ages. Just as there is a gradual decrease in physiological reserve in many organ systems as we age, the brain has a decrease in volume and white matter integrity with age. Additionally, cerebral blood flow declines with aging, which leads to decreased oxygen delivery and slowing metabolism. Depressing, right? Also very important though, is that endothelial cell function declines with age, leading to greater permeability of the blood-brain barrier, increasing the brain's susceptibility to systemic insults. 
So when there is a systemic insult, such as a hip fracture, there's an increase in inflammatory mediators that via a more leaky blood-brain barrier triggers neuroinflammation mediated by microglial cells. Activated microglial cells upregulate pro-inflammatory cytokines and promote neuronal apoptosis. Systemic um, inflammatory mediators also cause um, further dysfunction in endothelial cells, leading to an even greater exchange across the blood-brain barrier. So at this point, the consensus among the experts in the field is that despite having a lot to learn still, we can presume that POCD and delirium are mostly due to physiological stress rather than purely anesthetics. And there is some evidence to suggest that these neurological declines are perhaps partly an unmasking of future dementia, which would be supported by the increase in tau and alpha beta protein that have been observed after surgery. So how can we prevent these deleterious cognitive effects of surgery? Well, as we demonstrated earlier, there's a strong relationship between delirium and POCD, such that the preventative measures for one are likely to help the other. So what are some of the areas that have been, that have been investigated in terms of decreasing cognitive decline? In broad categories, there are preoperative strategies, though these are probably not as relevant for urgent surgeries like hip fractures, intraoperative strategies regarding anesthesia technique, and postoperative regarding pharmacological interventions and protocols. We won't have time to fully investigate each of these, but I think we can look at some of the more important findings out there. Data regarding type of anesthetic agents have only shown slight differences in cognitive effects, and these effects have mostly washed out with larger meta-analyses. Furthermore, adjunctive agents such as ketamine or dexmedetomidine um, intraoperatively haven't seemed to have any benefit. There has been some promising data regarding managing the depth of anesthesia. In this partially um, randomized study out of the UK, bispectral index monitoring, which utilizes continuous EEG measurements to manage depth of anesthesia, was found to lead to decreased rates of POCD up to 52 weeks after surgery. This was further supported by another randomized study utilizing bispectral index monitoring, where they found a reduction in both delirium and POCD at three months post-op. However, another larger randomized study of more than 1,200 patients demonstrated no difference in POCD, though there was a slight decrease in postoperative delirium. Perhaps surprising are the results of several randomized controlled trials comparing neuraxial and general anesthesia. This study out of Greece compared POCD after randomizing 70 patients over 65 undergoing hip fracture surgery to either spinal or general anesthetics. They found no, they found no significant differences in neurocognitive testing between the groups up to 30 days after surgery and actually had more cases of delirium in the spinal group. While the numbers of the last study were relatively small, several large meta-analyses have been performed that show no difference in post-op delirium or um, POCD between spinal and general anesthetics. To complicate things further, there have been several studies demonstrating that total intravenous anesthesia or TIVA has lower rates of POCD when compared to traditional inhalational anesthetics. At this point though, there was quite a bit of heterogeneity in technique and data acquisition. So I think it may be premature to state that TIVA is truly effective in reducing POCD. In general, antipsychotics and cholinesterase inhibitors have not been shown to be effective in preventing or treating delirium. Dexmedetomidine or Presidex is an alpha-2 agonist that has shown some benefit in, in the treatment of delirium um, in some randomized trials. Furthermore, multimodal pain medication regimens that help us decrease our use of opioid medications have also shown some benefit. As surgeons, we tend to downplay non-surgical or pharmacological treatment methods, but probably the most consistently effective method of preventing delirium has been multidisciplinary efforts to improve orientation in the perioperative period. In a Cochrane review in 2016, they found that while pharmacological interventions were no better than placebo, there was strong evidence supporting multi-component interventions to prevent delirium. And let me remind you how rare it is to read the term strong evidence from a Cochrane review. Furthermore, the majority of the included studies were in the orthopedic setting. One program that has been specifically designed to help prevent delirium in our patients is the HELP program, which is currently in use at University of Utah. The program helps identify geriatric patients that are, most at, that are at high risk of delirium and proactively implements multi-component treatments to prevent delirium. And in a study out of JAMA in 2017, um, abdominal surgery patients randomized to receive interventions via a HELP program had a 56% reduction in post-op delirium and a shorter average length of stay by two days. So I'd like to take a moment to draw attention to the current status of the HELP program at the University of Utah. Under usual circumstances, the HELP program at the university has about 40 volunteers who work to implement multi-component interventions in preventing delirium. Unfortunately, due to COVID, there has been a moratorium on volunteers at the hospital. So help has had to function virtually with the use of iPads over the past few months. So at this point, there are iPads connected to help volunteers that are provided on every floor. 
We currently have three on E60. So if you have a patient on your service you think could benefit from the health program, and I'm sure we all do, then please let the HUC know um, that you'd like to have the patient connected with the health volunteers and they can provide iPads to them. Hopefully we'll be, we will be back to having in-house volunteers in the coming months. So in conclusion, post-operative delirium and cognitive decline are both extremely common and unfortunately have serious long-term repercussions for our patients. The etiology is assuredly multifaceted, but we now know that the cognitive effects of surgery are primarily due to the systemic inflammation. Armed with the information I presented today, we should counsel patients and family on the high likelihood of cognitive effects following surgery and emphasize the importance of frequent reorientation and early mobilization. Finally, as we look to potential ways to prevent and treat this, um, we know that at this point, engaging in multidisciplinary efforts such as the HELP program is probably the most effective strategy we have. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to, um, to Miriam Beatty um, with the HELP program, who kind of gave me some of her information and um, stuff they study, as well as um, Dr. Um, the, both the Dr. Andersons. Um, anyways, I'd like to open up to any questions at this point. Thanks a lot, Tim. Um, I think that's a great topic for all of us to be thinking about. We've, we've definitely seen this in some of the literature that's come out in the hand surgery world, um, meaning a lot of what we do is under local, which has been a major change in the last 10 years, and some of the data looking at complication rates, readmission for any reason, et cetera, um, mirrors this for people having even sedation or uh, general anesthesia compared to local procedures. There's a slightly higher rate of um, medical complications. So not necessarily cognitive decline as you're talking about, but uh, kind of supporting evidence for what you're getting at. Um, any other thoughts from people? Um, Dr. Stotz, do you have a question? Tim, I was <clears throat> wondering if you could just say, I'm totally unfamiliar with the health program and what they do. Could you just give us two sentences on kind of what their strategy is or? Yeah, totally. Um, so basically the, the short answer is it's kind of all the stuff you learn in med school that we should be reorienting our patients. We should be having continuity of care. We should be, you know, encouraging normal wake sleep cycles. Um, and essentially the problem is, is that as you know, as residents or, or attending physicians, we don't really have time to do that. Um, and so you kind of count on the rest of the staff to do that. So what the health program is, is essentially bridging that gap. So they have volunteers who are mostly, you know, kind of pre-medical students or kind of that, you know, kind of level of training um, who basically volunteer their time to, to um, come and spend time with um, our more um, like elderly patients with hip fractures to basically just sit with them in the room and reorient them and talk to them and play games and <laughs> just kind of normal stuff, which kind of seems at one point, like it's a little bit trivial, but um, for, um, for these patients, it, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and instead of just being left in a room by themselves in the dark um, with just randomly coming in and getting blood draws. So Tim, other than asking the help program to help, is there anything else that you learned that we should do differently to help minimize this? I think so. Most of the most of the data um, at this point, obviously, is is showing that there's not any like silver bullet um, for all of this. I think, though, based on the kind of the current trajectory of the rest of the data, that I think we can safely say that a lot of the things we're already doing, meaning pushing for treating hip fractures quickly, um, for mobilizing people early, um, for getting people out of the hospital sooner rather than later. Um, I think all of those things are um, at least, you know, based on the rest of the data would show that that's probably the right place to be pushing right now. There might come out with some, you know, way that, you know, some certain type of anesthetic regimen or some drug that is great. But at this point, I think the, the best thing is to, um, is to push for patients, um, you know, quickly mobilizing and getting out of the hospital and not staying in a dark room. Tim, and one uh, question, we, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, John. Well, um, thanks. Uh, can you tell us about how to stratify patients pre uh, op and, and then what would the conversation sound like with, between you and the patient and the family pre op for non fracture for, for elective surgery? Yeah, so as far as stratifying the patients preoperatively, um, there's some data on that um, of looking at like exactly who's at risk. And 
you know, obviously the biggest risk factor we have is, is you know, that's easy is age. Um, and then obviously another huge risk factor is whether they've had any signs of dementia already. Um, and if they've had some signs of dementia, the, there's data to say that they're much higher risk of having delirium and then much higher risk of having a more quick decline in their dementia following surgery. Um, and then, um, and then also um, medical conditions in general, like their ASA score um, has been shown to correlate as well. Um, and so all of that can give you a hint of kind of where your patient sits um, on the spectrum of, of how much they're going to be cognitively affected. Um, so I think the, the, the conversation I'd have with families before is kind of after getting a sense of, um, you know, where their family member is or where the patient is in terms of their, their kind of current cognitive state and their current functional status. Um, you know, I tell them that there's a significant risk that they have um, longer term cognitive decline. I would say that's up to 50% of, of my patients are going to have, a, you know, a hip fracture patient, for instance, is going to have some amount of cognitive decline at one week. Um, so when they're leaving the hospital, they're still going to feel somewhat confused and not completely right. Um, and, and I would tell them that that persists um, in at least 10% of the patients um, to three months and beyond um, and to expect that there is going to be What is beyond me to you? There, well, just like I showed in the data, three, three months is for sure where 10% is. And then there's some data to show that this is up to, you know, 30 to 40% of patients, depending on how extensive your neurocognitive testing is. Um, and so this, the studies like that one out of Duke where the neurocognitive testing was very extensive, um, they showed up to 40% of their patients having some cognitive effects, even up to one year. Um, so I, what I would tell patients is not only would it be up to three months, but likely some of this can be um, a permanent decline. Tim, thanks for um, presenting this topic. It's a really important one. Uh, as you know, in spine, the, um, this isn't such an uncommon issue that we have to deal with. And we have uh, for our elderly patients, uh, there's a whole delirium uh, geriatric protocol beyond help even that helps to make sure we're not getting them on some standard med that we use in our, in our order set that, that might actually be causing delirium also. So that th those things get reviewed. Uh, my question uh, is around something you mentioned about antipsychotics for use in this, in this population. We've, we've been using Seroquel for nighttime sleep aid to try and minimize sundowning in patients that have developed postoperative delirium. Uh, is there, in your readings, there better medicine than that? Or is that sort of what you've been talking about? And or should we be using that more as a preventative before they develop this these symptoms rather than waiting until that they have them? Um, I, I'd have to look up the exact data on Seroquel. Um, Dr. Brodkin, get back to you on that. As far as like the other um, antipsychotics, um, which was kind of more along that lines of like haloperidol um, and quetiapine, um, um, or sorry, not quetiapine, but, um, but um, as well as like the anticholinesterase stuff, the the, those medications, I'd say in general, when they've been shown them in the larger trials, um, they haven't made a difference. And people have certainly thought the same thing that if you could use these preventatively, maybe that would help. Um, and especially the ideas of kind of doing like the, um, the Presidex, um, where they would basically kind of just give that continuously afterwards. None of it has really showed to make any significant difference. There have been some studies every now and then that'll show some slight difference, but comparatively to, to the multimodal stuff like the HELP program, um, it's a pretty minimal effect. Um, and certainly the antipsychotics have the potential to actually be harmful to the patients. Um, now I would say like maybe giving them Seroquel at night probably is not harmful, um, but certainly once patients get floridly delirious um, and then we have to start treating them with antipsychotics just to keep them from, from hurting other people, um, that's when things kind of really go south. And there's good data to show that once they're getting antipsychotics, it's um, their outcome is significantly worse. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thanks, Tim. Well, let's move on. If nobody else has any other questions uh, to uh, Patrick Kellum.